And do I, if you have a question, just raise your hand. Just wait, wait for uh, for Dr. Chu to keep calling you. <laughs> to uh, to call on you, and if if you want to make a comment instead of just raising a question, feel free to do so. This is a, this is more of a dialogue for an evening, so don't just ask questions. I'll hand it over to you. Does so, anyone have any questions? During break, someone came up to me and said that the new law that was just passed by Congress, uh, giving the FDA more regulatory authority, also gave the FDA regulatory authority to require registration at, of clinical trials at clinicaltrials.gov. So that's great. And apparently, they even have the authority to levy penalties if you don't fill out all the, uh, all the blanks properly. So that's really good. Uh huh. Go ahead. Um, about the question about Europe, I was uh, listening to a lecture the other day about you know the cosmetic industry and most ingredients in cosmetics. You know, I think anything that was out before like '82 yeah. or something, they decided they're just not going to look into. You know, so we get it, but Europe does not. Europe has a you know since they have socialized healthcare and they actually have to worry about paying for their health care down the road, they don't accept that, so they're probably a lot more strict on their trials and follow-up than we are, I would imagine. Um, so, um, yeah, I think the philosophy is much different. There. I can't remember the name of it, but they assume it's dangerous until it's proven not, as opposed to, we just, you know, until we've proven that it's dangerous, we're leaving it out there. So I think that's a terrible probably different. Yeah, it hasn't always been that way. Um, 20, 25, 30 years ago, uh, the balance was very different. The FDA was much more careful than the European counterparts. Right. Now they and, have the and Europe had thalidomide, right? And we, right. we before, we, we didn't approve it here. So Europe ended up with a lot of little kids without arms and legs. I guess now that they have the European Union in there, they're bigger. Yeah. Now. So things can change, hopefully for the better. Can we go back for a moment to the issue of funding in universities? Because I think this is kind of, again, it's sort of near the heart of where things begin. And just as an example, could you, I don't know if you know, but could you tell us a little bit about how much money from the private sector funds research at Stanford? I mean, isn't a large portion of Stanford's research budget funded from the outside, or is it not? Most, most laboratory funding comes from, in, at least in the biological sciences, comes from the National Institutes of Health. I don't know what, now there is a significant fraction that comes from private foundations, you know, charitable foundations like that, Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Um, but in terms of funding from pharmaceutical companies, for example, there is a different block of money that flows in for clinical trials. I don't consider that research, though. Uh, that's not the kind of research I'm talking about. Those are clinical trials where the drug company is trying to do some studies to get approval, and they have to get a source of patients, and they give doctors funding to recruit patients to the trials. Those doctors usually don't write the papers, though. And so I don't, that's not really research. I think that's taking a handout. And would you say that that's... Uh, representative of academia in America generally, and or, and or is there a difference between private institutions like Stanford and public ones like UC? I, I don't think there's really that much of a difference. No, uh, like UCSF versus Stanford, we I, I don't we don't see ourselves as all that different from each other. Um, not really. Uh, I I don't I don't honestly is anybody from UCSF here? I, do, I don't know whether the uh, drug company sponsored trials, you know, I was sitting in an appointment and promotions committee meeting today. We we're trying to decide on the appointment of an assistant professor who, who does clinical work. And she listed 13 clinical trials on her CV as proving she did research. Every one of them was drug company sponsored. So somebody from a, <laughs> another part of the department who wasn't familiar with this asked me if that was research. I said, no. <laughs> yeah. So you don't feel that the pharmaceutical industry or even other private entities that benefit from university research have undue influence? They in do through that, 
right? This 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 professor, right? Right. Is is that's all getting, their experience? Yeah, is is doing work on behest of the drug companies, and they're paying part of her salary. They probably have her on board as a consultant. But they're not necessarily steering the research agenda. Uh, well, the, the irony of it is, she probably doesn't even have any say. <laughs> it's happening back at the drug company. They're deciding how the trial is to be conducted. She's a junior person anyway. But what about in terms of what areas of health to, to research, for instance? Oh, is, no. Is no. one kind of cancer getting more research funding than another because the oh. drug company feels like this yeah. is... This, Provides yeah. Yeah. Of yeah, yeah. You know, there, let's let's distinguish. There are two kinds of research. There's laboratory bench research, okay, which is the kind of stuff that actually leads to the breakthroughs that lead to the new drugs eventually down the line. There, that's investigator initiated by and large, and professors come up with a bright idea and they go do their thing. Then there's this other thing which I don't consider research. I think most people where the drug company comes in and says, will you do this trial for us? There, I, that's really a service that you're performing for the drug company. And, um, you know, that doesn't get you a whole lot of academic respect. Right? Uh, if, you, if you're seen as a flack for the drug companies, your reputation can go into the toilet. So you have to be very careful. But generally, the breakthrough kind of research, the stuff where you discover something new, Nobody's telling us what to do. Um, but we do respond to incentives, right? There was a lot of got, money got put into AIDS. And there, you know, the National Institute of Health is giving out more money there. Wow. Um, the Department of Defense, believe it or not, has lots of money for sponsoring breast cancer research, right? And they're handing out money. And you go, oh, I've got a bright idea about breast cancer research. And you apply for funding. So you do respond to these financial incentives to try to go after disease that the government thinks is really important. What do you think is the DOD's motivation for breast cancer Oh, research? that's a very interesting story. I, um, uh, the, it, it's, the Department of Defense doesn't have a motivation. What happened was that a coalition of activists, women activists, m many of them, breast cancer survivors wanted to raise money and get more money to help women with breast cancer. And they were really very powerful lobbyists in Congress. And what Congress was thinking about doing was maybe we'll put the money into the NIH budget. Well, everybody was afraid it would just disappear into the NIH budget. They wanted something that targeted breast cancer, so they came out with the bright idea of putting it into some other agency so that breast cancer would be just breast cancer. And so they came up with the Department of Defense. It was crazy. <laughs> uh, and you know, the, the guy in charge was a general, and he said, oh yeah, I think we're gonna spend this money on better, better mammograms. And you know, everybody, all of us scientists went, no you won't, that's the stupidest thing I heard. We need breakthroughs right, for breast cancer, not better mammograms. And, 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 and so, they, but they got their act together, actually. I really, I like that organization. I, I actually got one of their grants, and I actually recently got a grant. And, and as a result, the price I had to pay was I had to go review other grants. So I went there and watched how this thing all worked. And I'm sitting on this review committee with women who are breast cancer survivors. And they're reading the grants along with me. And I'm, I'm thinking, that's crazy. They don't know the science. But what I discovered was that these women are totally disinterested in better mammograms. They're reading this thing and they see something in Drosophila, fruit flies, and they go, hey, but that could be a breakthrough that could lead to some real great discovery. It looks really promising. What do you think? And they're pushing for the stuff that's really cutting edge. And, and so what they're doing as a result of being on this committee is the scientists think, oh, our responsibility, what are the funders going to think if, if we don't look at something that's really applied? And the women are sort of saying, no, 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 we're looking for the real breakthroughs. Don't, don't worry. You know, we're, we're, we're supporting you. So in a way, they got it just right. Because a lot of scientists who think they have, the man, they have a mandate to cure breast cancer next year aren't thinking 10 years down the line. So I, I, I kind of like, like the way they do that. But I did admit to a conflict of interest. I got money from them. <laughs> they funded some of my research. Yeah. So we do respond to those incentives. Yeah, we have a question. Uh, so this is kind of two questions. Um, I guess 
Because first I've heard that one of the um, you know hottest and most profitable mar markets for pharma industry is um, like all these heartburn and acid drugs, like the Prilosec, the Nexium. Oh, um, and I'm just wondering <laughs> what knowledge you have in that. Oh yeah. Oh, that um, that's dirty. And then <laughs> I, I want to hear all the dirt. But then my second question is. Um, I, because I feel like there's also been this mission of research on how damaging those drugs are and how unnecessary they are. Yeah. Do you know cases where pharma has actively um, suppressed or lobbied against research that is counter to Well, they've done, it's, it's worse than that. They've done phony research. Prilosec and Nexium is really cool. Prilosec is actually a really good drug that blocks the secretion of acids in your stomach. And if you've got real stomach ulcer problems, Prilosec is very good. It's, you know, it's, it, if antacids don't work, Prilosec can really be a lifesaver. Or, or if cimetidine doesn't work, so on. <clears throat> the patent ran out on Prilosec. And so, uh, I can't remember the company. So the company came up with Nexium. And they marketed it as the purple pill. They didn't quite tell you what it was. Little lights went on in the community. And, um, it turns out that Prilosec and Nexium are basically equivalent. Prilosec is a mixture of two molecules called stereoisomers. They have the identical chemical formula, but one is a left-handed version of the other. So the orientation is twisted differently. And those two stereoisomers, it turns out, are both active. They both work. One is maybe a few percent more active than the other. But the patent ran out. So they were going to lose their market share. And you know, a generic would come out, it's now over the counter, and so on. So what they came up with Nexium, what Nexium was, was one of the two stereoisomers, the one that was 5% more effective. And then they marketed the heck out of the thing, and they got a lot of people to ask for it. But it, it for all intents and purposes, is identical. To, uh, to Prilosec. In fact, Jerry Avorn calls it half a Prilosec <laughs> because it's only one of the two stereoisomers. But, you know, gram for gram, it's pretty much the same. It's, it's all marketing. Nexium is completely marketing. It's a completely useless drug. <laughs> Can you speak about, um, I don't know, like that class of drugs? Broadly, well, some of them are, you know, some people really need them and some people really don't. And obviously the drug company's goal is to get people to take it even if they don't need it. That's why the little purple pill didn't really focus on what was wrong with you. If you're not feeling good, if life is doing you in, go ask your doctor about Nexium. It didn't say it's, it's an antacid. <laughs> it, it's not, you know, it, and that's just wrong. And I, I think that kind of advertising really shouldn't be on television. It's just wrong. Uh, so do you know ways of, I guess, like researching the particular drugs or finding out, you know, what kind of lobbying yeah. for this drug, what kind of, you know, money or like, you know, funny politics are being pushed behind specific drugs? Like a way to... How do you get... Know, yeah. Like the story of blacks. I mean, it's huge and everybody knows about it and there's a lot of press, yeah, yeah. how can you dig up that dirt on other drugs? Google. <laughs> yeah, you, you can just Google stuff. And, and actually, during the break I told you about three books you could read and yeah. articles. Yeah, I mean, I just feel like Google just pulls up ads for the drugs. No, not necessarily, no. So. Yeah, you could, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, um, I think, I think there, there are books out there that are very good that can get you an introduction. Um, you can look up specific things. I, you know, obviously I hear about a lot more things. People email me because I've given this talk about 30 or 40 times. Um, yeah, it, it curls your hair. The, um, I just found out two weeks ago the, the orthopedic department. You know, orthopedic surgeons put in artificial hips and the hardware costs money, right? And companies sell the hardware. Um, the orthopedic uh, department at Massachusetts General Hospital last year got eight million dollars from one firm that sells artificial hips. The chairman of the department got as a consulting fee 1.3 million dollars. This is a chunk change. That's incredibly dirty money. 
right? How could anybody be worth $1.3 million for consulting? <laughs> it's impossible. <laughs> Here's my follow-up to, I think, the issue that's been brought up here is, uh, I walk into a doctor's office. Yeah. I'm the consumer of the drug. Yeah. But I'm not educated enough to determine if it's the right drug for me. Right. Okay. In that way, the doctor is the, the actual consumer. No, you're the consumer and the doctor is the middleman. The middleman. Yeah. So how, I guess the base, the most basic question we can ask is how can I trust that the doctor is representing me? Yeah. And representing my interests. Yeah. You know, one of, one of, um, one, a lay person told me that she, she decided to change doctors because she saw so many pharma reps in the doctor's office. Mm -hmm. It's not a bad criterion. It's hard. Personally, one reason I give this talk is I think one of the biggest threats of this whole business is the integrity of the entire profession. <laughs> Pure and simple. The doctors are on the tape, many of them. And, and once the public loses its trust in physicians, we don't have a profession anymore. You know, we're, we're sort of down there with the mafia. It's hard. That's a lot of years of medical school to, to end up, you know, losing the respect of the public. It's it's not a good thing. We we really need we need to guard the integrity of the profession. We need to get this stuff to stop. And and just because the pharmaceutical companies use hardball marketing tactics doesn't mean we have to participate in it. Okay, but play devil's advocate for a second. There has got to be a reason the doctor is uh, is doing that, and it's not. I don't believe it's simply money. Is there a reason that they're willing to listen to a pharma rep? Yeah, it, yeah. You know, you know what it is. Is I, I'm sorry. I it isn't. It isn't that the bribe is very big. It's often just a free lunch, and that to me is even worse. That you're willing to listen to a pharmaceutical rep just for a free lunch. I think your price should be a lot higher if you're gonna if you're gonna do that. I kind of feel like too like there's a bigger, deeper question embedded in that. Um, even if the doctor has you know perfectly great intentions, tries to stay neutral, tries not to listen to the pharma rep. Um, I feel like like Dr. Chu said, there's just like issues of integrity in the way that drugs are researched and that a lot of the information isn't out there. <laughs> like you could go home and like Google this drug to death and still not find satisfactory answers on whether it's right for you just because the data is not there, yeah. you know, or that the data is skewed, you know, or that I think you know, this drug was approved like five years ago and um, we still haven't seen the effects of it long term. I feel like that's a bigger, like that's a bigger question, you know, I'm, I don't know how to answer, like, you know, how to figure out if this drug is, is right for you, you know, as a patient, I speak more to that, Oh. As well. okay, let's see, which way should I go? <laughs> Kishore said, asked me, why does the doctor listen to the farmer rep? That's a very complicated issue. So if you're a male doctor, I can tell you <laughs> that most of these pharma reps don't have any science education. In fact, in fact, there have been articles on what it takes to be a pharma rep. The best qualification to get you to be a pharma rep, and this isn't a joke, it really is true, they actually, the drug companies actually go out and look for college cheerleaders because they're generally very attractive and they're very perky, and they have good personalities, and yada, yada, yada. And, and you know, that, that kind of stuff works. And then they come bearing goodies for all the office staff, and they have all these articles that they just give you. And, and I think what we need to do is to let doctors know that despite their protest the contrary, that does influence them, and they need to be careful. Is there no educational upside to having pharma reps though? Because you could imagine that there's maybe a pharmaceutical company has a drug that really does have a positive impact on your patients. And you have a small town doctor, you know, somewhere 
Yeah. So, so who should be in charge of continuing medical education for doctors? Should it be the people selling the drugs, or should it be an unbiased group of people? It's pretty obvious what the answer is. So why is it? Why did that not happen? Why did the industry evolve? Well, it's gotten worse. It, it used to be that doctors paid for their continuing medical education. Now they get it for free. Most of continuing medical education in this country is now paid for by the pharmaceutical companies. So it's crazy to me that doctors are not willing to pay for their continuing education. It's not that expensive. How did they sell their souls for such a low price? What it's ridiculous. What you're talking about is definitely something that I've experienced personally in my experience with doctors. I've, I've been to a lot of doctors over the last 10, 15 years. And in that time, I've seen my uh, prescription load go up dramatically. And I think part of that is managed care. You know, doctors have 10, 15 minutes with you. They don't really have time to get to know you or to really listen to you or to really figure out what's going on with you, what your problem is, to really diagnose you. And so I think part of that is, you know, really quick, simple, here, have some pills. Um, but I think part of it is, you know, they're getting all these pills thrown at them way more than they used to, even like 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And um, the number of pills that I've had tossed at me, the number and types of drugs that I've had offered to me are just crazy. I mean, just drawers full of drugs. I, I, you know, this one doctor I go to, he'll just open his closet. Oh, well, let me give you one of these and one of these. Oh, the one free of these samples. And one of these. And, yeah. 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 You know, the, the free sample, you, you know, there are two groups of people who give out free samples. Doctors and the guy on the street out there. <laughs> yeah? And they have exactly the same purpose to get you hooked. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, after, after and it a while works. of this, I, I just stop because yeah. I, I feel like, um, you know, the only person who really knows your body is you, not your doctor, because you spend more time with it. And, um, and you know some of these. Things, I think that's really sad because you've lost your trust in doctors. Yes. Well, some of the some of these things that they were diagnosing me with, I don't even have. It, you know, it was just like, oh, five minutes. Oh, you must have this. Here, take this drug. You know, and it's like, you know, I don't I don't have these conditions. I'm I'm healthy and I don't need these drugs. And you know, they're pushers. So you, actually, one of your questions is why are they pushing these drugs on you? So here's a really interesting statistic: for every physician in the entire United States, drug companies spend. $10,000 a year marketing to every physician on average across the US. If you're a high prescribing doctor, you get much more of the marketing targeted to you. If you're just a guy working in the lab, you don't get any more. So that's $10,000 for every MD in the entire country. $10,000? So it's, it does have an effect. If it didn't have an effect, they wouldn't be spending that kind of money. And you, you know, oh by the way, you know how they know they have an effect. This is really cool. They can buy lists of who prescribed what from the pharma pharmacy down the street. And on the list is your DEA number. And attached to the DEA number is the prescriptions you wrote that week. And if a pharma rep takes you to dinner, they can go out, go, go home online, type in your DEA number, drug enforcement agency number, and find out what you prescribed. But they have to know who corresponds to this DEA number? The American Medical Association sells the linkage between the name and the DEA number for millions of dollars a year. Tens of millions of dollars. Talk about corruption. It's, it's disgusting. Right? Do you, do you like that idea? You know, like, it, it's, a, it's just incredible to me that they can find out what I'm prescribing after having approached me. And one of my students came up to me and said that they even went to the trouble of calling his patient and telling his patient that the patient should come back and ask for the drug that he was getting a holiday for. Hmm. That's yeah. I just wanna, there's a great New York Times Magazine article from a couple weeks ago that that was in, but it 
it's a sort of first-hand account from a psychiatrist who goes to be one of these doctor reps, um, and it's sort of his chronicle. He gives his, talks he for gives, his He drug, gives talks yeah. for a lot of money for a drug that he really believes in. That there's really effects good, or, effects yeah. or, and there's really good data on. But that over time, the data begins to suggest that there are some issues with the drug, and he begins to sort of feel uncomfortable with his talking about it. And then ultimately, when he raises the issue in one of his talks and says, well, there's this new data emerging, and this might actually be an issue, um, the, the drug rep who's sitting in the back approaches him and is like, were you, were you feeling OK today? You seemed a little odd. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's, but it's a, worth, it's a worthwhile article. It was, a, it was, it was a very good ago. article. It was really good. I thought it was extremely thoughtful because he was actually involved and he had he had some misgivings but he kind of rationalized it and he he well, talked about his mixed feelings. And he, he does a really good job portraying the importance of education and why why it would be appealing to both be a, a speaker in one of those events and then also be the receiving doctor. And the doctors don't really have a lot of time with management anymore and, and there are so many new drugs, it's so difficult to find out about them. Um, that, the, that these talks are really appealing, and he does a really good job portraying that, but then also showing the pitfalls of them. Yeah, at the end of the article, I guess someone invites him to go attend one of those talks, and he says, no thank you, I'm not going to go anymore. Right. He's not going to give any talks, and he's not going to go to them anymore. Uh -huh. um, I, I'm thinking about you know, like how we as individuals deal with it, and what, I, what, I'm, what I'm looking at is how can we get out of falling into the doctors and dealing with I thought about my dad, who is older, he's 64 or something, and all of the, the medical people that he goes to are part of academia. You know, his wife had um, a clot in her head. And so he had friends and he found out and they flew her over to Harvard because there was this great doctor that knew about clots and brains and they did this. And, and that's, I know where my dad focuses. And what I'm thinking about is like, what is the source of evil? I mean, bad people chase money, and where money is, you wind up with problems. It's the oil industry, and that's SBC, and that's and that's the pharma industry because it's not properly regulated. And then what you do is you start saying, wait a minute, the AMA and its exclusivity is probably the source of the problem. Everyone chases money, and there's something that's not mediated. Most of us aren't in the AMA. Right. And then on the other hand, what we do is we look at academia. Is that place where we can start, because you know actually most of the doctor, like most of the time when I go to the doctor, it's when I'm in school, I go in and out of school, and I do all of my going to the physician, I haven't seen anybody in 10 years, but suddenly I'm going to check this, this, that, and that, do whatever I can, I kind of load up and then I leave school and get back into Kaiser and try and stay away and do better. And, and that seems to be something that might be a solution, is just think in terms of academia seems to be a haven of reasonably well-protected doctors and reasonably well-protected support. Because I know that when I'm at Kaiser, I'm dealing with just a different kind of doctor. And yeah, a lot of the doctors at Kaiser are actually very good, I think. Yeah, but, when I'm, but compared to academia, where there's something that's, these people are not leveraged. And yeah, actually, comparing to Kaiser, Kaiser is not, you know, Kaiser, Long before Stanford did, throughout the drug reps. Mm. Okay. Great. Yeah. And Kaiser is very interested in managing the cost of medical care, uh -huh. and they're a nonprofit. So, you know, the, their basic raison d'etre economically is pretty sound. Okay. Right. So and they discovered that pharma reps don't help them because pharma reps lead to unnecessary prescribing of drugs. So they threw them out. So where else can we look? Well, you know, I came to the same conclusion, and I decided one thing that I would try to work for is at the very least, maybe I could get Stanford to throw the pharma reps out. So I just worked and worked at doing that. Yeah, eventually it happened. Not just to me, of course, but, you know, I, I, because I think if academia leads the way, right, and shows, you know, we train all the new doctors anyway, right? If we train the new students properly and start a new generation of people who haven't gotten used, you know, who don't have to pay for yachts, you know, the mortgage on yachts and things, then we can get somewhere. But if you, you're already leveraged up the wazoo with your summer house, and you, you're not going to be able to stop taking the money. But 
but for the medical students who are still somewhat idealistic, the place to go start is in mm -hmm. medical schools, I think. Um, but Kaiser, I really, uh, you know, Kaiser isn't the paragon of everything, but the, the, the basic structure of Kaiser, I think, is good. So as a physician, what would you suggest, um, you know, you touched a little bit about, you know, continuing medical education and, um, you know, even at Stanford throwing out drug reps, but what would you suggest as a physician, what what can you do in order to be, you know, continue to uphold, you know, moral value and, uh, and, and the profession? And, I mean, like, doctors don't have a lot of time. And, talked about how it's like, you know, pressure to go to these talks and, you know, to, to understand what drugs may or may not do and, you know, to negotiate whether or not they're going to use them. But what, I mean, what have you used, what, have, what would you suggest you guys? Well, I think physicians shouldn't be learning from pharma reps. Pharma reps are generally cheerleaders. Yeah. So how can they be teaching? Pharma reps actually give you the article that was published in the New England Journal that makes their drug look good. Well, you shouldn't take that, even though it was in the New England Journal. You should go read the New England Journal, plus the editorials, plus the other points of view that disagree. You should, you should look in the literature. You should go to conferences. You should pay your way. You should decide what you read, not have someone else decide for you. Those are very simple things. So basically, And don't take those free gifts. Uh -huh. Yeah, don't take the free gifts. And the reason for, not, for the uh, gifts is there's always a sense of obligation when you get a gift. And even if it's subconscious, you're gonna you're you're gonna feel that sense of obligation. In a survey, um, in a survey, 61% uh, of medical residents claimed that they were not influenced by the pharma reps. But the same group of residents, about 85% of them thought their other fellow residents were influenced by <laughs> So, So, you, you know, just don't talk to them. And, and the great thing is if you don't talk to them and they don't have a job anymore, that's 35% of the budget for the pharma company. Save. The price of drug goes immediately down by 35%. You're doing your share. Are you a doctor? No. <laughs> well, I, I just I think it's interesting because, you know, a lot of doctors, they try to do their own research and figure out personally for themselves. Yeah. But it's difficult to, like, read yes. through the web and the crazy amount of information and to decide themselves uh, which drug of the ten that are out there to use. Yeah. So no, I, I have this problem, sometimes too. Sometimes it's unrealistic to go yeah. through the masses of research. I think it's just as unrealistic to bank on the hit and miss yeah. thing of who the pharma rep happens to be in your office. And just because you happen to have a Pfizer rep in your office shouldn't determine whether you exactly. prescribe Lipitor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think for certain common things though, you know, in terms of what's the real data on cholesterol lowering drugs, you can read a review article. Mm -hmm. With respect to the, the manufacturer given class of drugs, Who's looking at broad impacts of drugs on, on society, on communities? So, for instance, antidepressants or ADD drugs on kids and stuff like that. Who's, who's responsible for that and is that happening? Well, the data, you know, you, for example, antidepressant for, for teenagers. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this big scandal <coughs> about antidepressants actually precipitating suicide among teens. Um, one of my fellow professors' son, uh, was a Stanford student who committed suicide, and it turned out he had gotten antidepressants by mail order on, through the internet. And he discovered his son dead, and then when he got his son's computer as, you know, the going away present, he looked through and he discovered that's how his son got these drugs. So, yeah, so he wanted to know who's looking at this. Um, uh, there's a huge scandal here because that data was sort of out there and and the news has has revealed that the drug companies were actually suppressing the information. And we kind of wish the FDA had been a little bit more proactive about asking that a warning label be put on it. And that actually came up in the congressional hearings that led to this new bill that was just passed. So now the FDA does have the power to actually force 
the warning label to be there. It's ultimate is the FDA. Right now, they're, they're, they're what's standing there as, a, as our guardian for the, that particular issue. But they don't have funds to look at that. They just got funding. End of September. The bill passed at the end of September. $155,000 a year. Not a lot. Oh, it's not a lot of money. It used to be zero. So $155,000 a year. Not a lot of money. But they have the authority now. They have the authority to actually require it. They have the data sitting in their data banks. Uh, but I mean, you, you could imagine that on education or whatever, the, these drugs do have a powerful impact, and it would take millions of dollars to study and, and see. Yeah, but they, they had the data, because the, the data all gets submitted by the drug companies, it's required by law. What wasn't required was that the FDA actually make it public. Is there any guarantee that the, that the data comes you know, clean? The data no, clean. as you found out. Right. <laughs> but sometimes it's clean enough, <laughs> and, you, and you can get what you need. I mean, yeah. if you have a data bank that the yeah. farm has so, submitted, and they've just deleted cases. Yeah, so, yeah. But, but there are some really very valuable data banks. Um, needless to say, I was very happy to give this talk at Google, because they're very good at searching out information. Mm -hmm. And one of my messages to them, since they get to spend, you know, 15% of their time, on doing anything they want was to try to convince a bunch of them to think about this problem, how to get your hands on the data, and then actually get it out there. And so data banks like Medicare actually can be queried to link you know, this drug with this outcome, and, and do data mining, and see what correlations you come up with. Yeah, so there are ways of doing it. And, and Jerry Avorn, this person I told you about, um, who wrote this book about, about this issue, just wrote an article in the New England Journal of Medicine this week about this kind of research being very important for the future. Data mining. And it's becoming more accessible now, too. It's getting computerized, digitized. Yeah. Okay, let's take two more questions. Um, on a lighter topic, anything about drug names, they seem kind of random to me. How, anything to be said about how drugs are named? Uh, no. Usually the trade names are almost impossible to pronounce. And the, the, ge the generic name is impossible, and the, the proprietary name is really catchy. So I, I have a very hard time saying Bevacuzumab, but Avastin is much easier. And that's usually the way it works. And is there, just back to an earlier comment about advertising on TV, Yeah. Uh, any sense of whether that has done anything good, or is it all bad news? I, does anybody just, have any sense that, I, I don't have any sense it's done any good. <laughs> I frankly don't see any good at all in it. Do you? <coughs> I, if I was selling TV time, I probably would love it. Huh? It scares away. Because they, they say take this drug, and then it may cause blindness, or dizziness, or headaches. Oh, oh well that's good. The FDA does, <laughs> the FDA does require that. <laughs> that's really fast. Yeah. Yeah, they do it. They do it though, as the woman is floating through the meadow with butterflies around her hair, and, and they're hoping you don't hear that. But, but the FDA does require that little disclaimer at the end, and it kind of takes away from it. Yeah, it's like, well, so for that scratch, blindness. Okay, give me some. Yeah, but they they have actually they've actually gone overboard in some cases for these drugs, and um, um, for Viagra, they, they actually were selling it. Remember Mitch? He used to be called the wild thing. Well now, with Viagra, he's back. So, that was on television. Yeah, yeah, that was good. Um, they, the FDA actually asked them to take that off because they couldn't substantiate the claims. Do you take Viagra? Yeah, <laughs> yeah they, they really couldn't substantiate them. Um, and so on the basis of not sub insubstantial claims, they, but it was obviously, it had, you know, the purpose was weird. It was very weird. It, it, the idea behind that ad was that college students, who really usually don't have a problem in this regard, 
only have the problem when they're drunk. <laughs> so the idea was, this is a drug where you can get drunk and still have your fun afterwards. And, and that was kind of offensive. I'm offended. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take one last question. Oh, I'm going to ask. <laughs> no one else has a question. Uh, so you've been given this talk how many times now? Uh, maybe 30 or 40 times. Uh, over how long do you feel like you've About three or four years. In that time, do you have hope? <laughs> Things are getting better. Yeah, because in that time, actually, because it's interesting, our dean, actually, of our medical school, I think wanted to throw the drug reps out. And so I was giving this talk. He heard I gave the talk. So he asked me to give the talk to the department chair. And he's, he was obviously using me because <laughs> cause he obviously wanted this to happen. And, and, so I, and then he asked me to come back and give the talk again to the, his executive steering committee and, you know, that kind of thing. And we threw the drug reps out, right? So I got used for that purpose. And, and then um, I, I've talked to high school students, and I've talked to residents. And what happened a few years ago was the medical students at Stanford decided that they were going to have a drug-free day. So they kind of fanned out through all the clinics and threw away all the freebies. <laughs> you know, all the little notepads and the free pens and those little <laughs> flashlights. And they went around and took all that stuff off the people and threw them away. Um, I think those are good things because uh, uh, what I don't want to see happen is stupid laws that over-regulate the whole thing. But what I'd like to see happen is a change in attitude that everybody kind of agrees. You know, that's the wrong way to act. And, you know, if we're going to be doctors, we need to act differently. And I think that's starting to happen. There's beginning, you know, some of the people who used to leave hate mail messages on my phone, when I see them in public now, they go, they always preface their statements, well, yeah, the drug companies really do get out of hand. These are the same people who told me that I was a liar before. And so, and I don't think they've changed, by the way. It's just become convenient in public to say those things because to say the opposite, which is what they were saying before, is now seen as maybe not the right thing. So things do gradually change when we realize that some of these things are wrong. Because they're not wrong in the obvious way where you know, you're doing drug, you're selling cocaine, or you know, marketing prostitution, or you know, raping people and murdering them. These are more subtle things. But I, I think given that we're doctors and we're supposed to be healing, we do have to meet a higher standard than the average mafiosa don. So, so I think things are changing gradually. Yeah. Well, I think that's a fabulous analogy to end on. <laughs>
where, uh, when things are happening, not necessarily where, as we did tonight. <laughs> um, and there's also a sign up for another science events mailing list, which is fantastic. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you all again next month. Thanks. Thank